Praise the Lord, everyone. Pastor Ryan Johnson here. Welcome to the Paradise and Pahrump District Sabbath Morning Worship Service, which is now called the Spirit and Truth Sabbath Morning Worship Service. Pastor Peter Neary will be giving the message today, and it's going to be a blessing. But why, you ask, Spirit and Truth, what's that all about? Because, friends, during our frustrations about where we can worship right now, we are reminded of what Jesus says to the woman at the well. This is in John chapter 4. The day cometh, he says, and now is when the true believers will worship the Lord, not in this mountain or in that temple, but in spirit and in truth. And John, who is the author of the Gospel of John, has a similar experience in Revelation on the Isle of Patmos when he's all by himself, not able to be at the temple, but he still as an experience with Jesus. So we may not be together in a building, but we can certainly worship our God in spirit and in truth. Let's worship the Lord together. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her. Sweet. 
happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading that goes along with the sermon today is found in Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, verse 2. And here's what it says. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and teach you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this worship service, this divine hour. And we invite your presence to be with us and that you would bless each person who has joined. But we want you to receive this as a gift from us, feeble though it may be, this worship service, that it bring honor and glory to your name, for you are the worthy one. And so receive it now, and bless each one participating. And thank you for hearing this prayer and answering it, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Sabbath children. My name is Lily Ann, and the title of today's story is Caught in the Act. A similar story can be found in John chapter 8, verses 3 to 11, and the story is about Tara. Tara was a shy little girl. She didn't say much. Her clothes were always kind of tattered. Her backpack was raggedy. She had holes in her shoes. And one time she even had lice in her hair and she had to shave all her hair off. It did grow back. Nobody knew where Tara lived. Nobody knew who her parents were. She didn't have any friends. And actually she lived alone with her grandma Tara was not very popular and actually some of the kids at her class didn't like her very much because they thought she was weird. So they came up with a plan one day to get her kicked out of school so they wouldn't have to see her in class anymore. I know, that's really mean, isn't it? So they came up with this elaborate plan and one day when the teacher wasn't looking, they got a bag of marshmallows and they put them in her backpack. And one of the kids brought her favorite toy to school and put that in Tara's backpack too. And then when it was break time, Tara went to her backpack to get an extra pencil. And when she reached in her backpack, oh, she found the marshmallows. Now Tara was very hungry. She never got to eat breakfast. She never had any cool snacks to share or toys to show off. And she hadn't, she couldn't remember the last time she had a marshmallow. And so she reached her hand in the bag and took out a marshmallow and took a bite. Mmm. And it was soft and sweet and fluffy. And she was so excited and she had no idea who put, who put it in her backpack. And she just, she couldn't wait to get home and take it and take the marshmallows home to grandma. And maybe they could make um, s'mores together. The kids went to find teacher Michael because they didn't, they'd been spying on her and they saw her eat the marshmallow. And so they went to get teacher Michael and said, teacher, teacher, um, 
Our stuff has been stolen. I brought some snacks. I brought these marshmallows to school today, said Bob. And I can't find them. And then Sue said, I brought my favorite toy so I could play with it and I can't find it. But we think we know who has them. Somebody stole them and we think we know who. And teacher Michael said, really? Who do you think took, took your stuff? And they said together, it was Tara. Let's go find her. And so they hurried off and went to find her and sure enough, she was sitting there eating the marshmallow. And they said, look, see, see, we told you, teacher. She, look, she's eating the marshmallow. And I bet she has my toy too. And teacher Michael said, hmm, Tara, is this true? And Tara's eyes got real big because she was so shocked to see everybody around. And she said, no, teacher, I found them. And the, the kid said, no, no, she stole them. Look in her backpack. And one of them went and grabbed her backpack and dumped everything out. And sure enough, there was the little, the, the there was Sue's toy, her little lamb. And she said, look, there's my lamb. There's my, this. that's my favorite toy and she has it. And Tara's eyes got really big and she started shaking because she, had, she hadn't she had even seen the lamb in her backpack. And she, she looked down, she couldn't even, she couldn't believe what was happening. She was so scared and she thought to herself, oh no, I'm gonna get kicked out of school. And I don't know how I'm gonna tell grandma that I got kicked out of school, what am I gonna do? She was so scared she couldn't say a word. She just stood there and was shaking. Now, teacher Michael smelled a setup and he was like, something's not right here. And he thought to himself, okay, I have a plan. Here's what I'm gonna do. So he turned around without saying a word and he went back to his desk and he sat down and left all the kids there and started writing. And the kids just thought that he was ignoring them. And they said, but teacher, teacher, aren't you gonna do anything about that? She needs to get expelled. We need to get her kicked out because she stole our stuff. Teacher, teacher. And he just kept on writing. And after a while, he straightened up and the kids had gotten closer to see what he was doing because they thought that he just was grading papers or something. And when they got closer and they saw the paper, and this is what teacher Michael had been writing. These are all the bad things that the kids had done when they thought that nobody was looking, but teacher Michael had seen all of that. And so teacher Michael said, if any of you have never done anything on that list, you be the first one to go and tell the principal. And all of a sudden Sue said, oh, my stomach hurts. I need to go to the restroom and she went away. And then Bob said, oh, mm, I, I'm gonna go color or something. So he went to go color. And the other kids said, oh, I think I gotta go do my homework. So uh, they went to do their homework. So this one said, I gotta go play. And one by one, they all left. And Tara was just looking down the whole time, shaking. And teacher Michael came over and said to her, Tara, where are the kids that were accusing you? And Tara looked up and she said, well, geez, I don't know, I guess they left. And she said, I'm so sorry. I promise, 
I found those things. I didn't steal them. And teacher Michael said, it's okay. Just be careful from now on, okay? Before you eat any snacks or if you ever find a toy, you come check with me first, okay? And Tara said, okay. But none of the kids ever bothered Tara again. They left her alone from that day on. Now in the Bible, the other name for Michael is Jesus. And Jesus is always there watching over us and protecting us. And whenever we do anything wrong, like really wrong, like the things that were on the list or any other uh, bad thing, Jesus is always there ready to forgive us as if we confess our sins. And he helps us live a better life. And he makes us good by the power of his name. I hope you enjoyed this story and I hope you have a great week. Bye. When we see things happening that only God could have done, we come to know God. As we pray, we come to know God. As we worship and fellowship, we come to know God. Through his journey, Abraham came to know him. Through forgiveness, even through the miraculous birth of his son Isaac. Elijah came to know God as he delivered God's messages. When fire crackled down from heaven on Mount Carmel, as ravens fed him by the brook, he knew God. The early church came to know God, seeing the work of the Holy Spirit, seeing the Spirit work in others, seeing it through others, and even through the trials of persecution, they came to know God. Here at Paradise, Pahrump, and Oasis, we too seek to know God through our worship, through the miracles, through prayer, through His deliverance. But Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. So guess what? In getting to know Him, we must also hear and heed His voice, as did the early church, or Elijah, or Abraham. Hmm. How does He call to you? How is God calling you to lead? How is He calling you to help? How is He calling you to be a good steward? Let's be determined to know our God and to hear his call. Hi and happy Sabbath. I hope everyone is having a truly blessed Sabbath, a great and wonderful day. I uh, would like to share some scripture with you today. I'd like to share from Hebrews chapter 10 and this is from verse 22. So chapter 10 of Hebrews verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to invite you into the most solemn part of our day, the most solemn part of our service. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, our God in heaven, 
God, we just want to come before you, humbling ourselves before your throne, and we want to first thank you. Thank you for your many, many blessings throughout the week, and what a great and wonderful blessing of the Sabbath we have. Thank you, God, for your love, for your mercy, and your everlasting peace. God, I ask that you please hear the special prayers on our prayer list. Even those that have not come out and those that have an unspoken prayer. Father, if it be your will, I ask that you please grant these prayers. Even though we go through hard times, Father, we, we have to remember that we go through hard times in order to be built up. And we thank you and we rejoice for the hard times. Now, Father, I ask that you please bless those that are watching, those that are listening. Bless them and also bless the pastor as he brings a wonderful message that you and the Holy Spirit have given him in order for us to be blessed. Let us all have open ears and open eyes. Father, we look forward to the many blessings you have in store for us as we hold fast on our faith. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, I hope everyone has a blessed, holy, wonderful, beautiful Sabbath day. God bless everybody. Hello, friends. I'm Anissa, and this is your Spotlight on the Spirit of Prophecy. Our quote comes from the book Christ Object Lessons in the section titled The Church of Today. Listen to this. When the Israelites entered Canaan, they did not fulfill God's purpose by taking possession of the whole land. After making a partial conquest, they settled down to enjoy the fruit of their victories. In their unbelief and love of ease, they congregated in the portions already conquered, instead of pushing forward to occupy new territory. Thus, they began to depart from God. By their failure to carry out His purpose, they made it impossible for Him to fulfill to them His promise of blessing. Is not the church of today doing the same thing? With the whole world before them in need of the gospel, professed Christians congregate where they themselves enjoy gospel privileges. They do not feel the necessity of occupying new territory. They refuse to fulfill Christ's commission. Friends, it is important to remember that our objective is not to maintain church as it makes us most comfortable and personally well-suited. Our objective is to spread the gospel to reach others. This is the command of Jesus. God bless you and keep studying. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin. I resign my gracious Redeemer, my Savior of God. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, to Thank
was speaking at a camp meeting in the Midwest. I was the morning speaker, but the special speaker was Elder Mark Finley. And of course, a lot of people came to camp meeting because he's a loved and respected Christian gentleman. And I'll never forget that when Sabbath came and he finished the sermon and remember you know, usually the preliminaries at a camp meeting go on and on and on. And so the sermon ends later and later. And it was time for lunch and there was only a short amount of time be um, before Elder Finley had to speak again in the afternoon. And I'll never forget, I was already in the cafeteria. And when he disengaged from all the people talking to him, they brought him in the cafeteria, put him in the front of the line, got his food, and sat him down at the end of the table. Unfortunately, it was the table right in the flow of traffic. And friends, I want you to know everybody coming out of the line with their food. Almost everyone stopped and said something to Elder Finley. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, let, let the guy eat, will you? Leave him alone, but no, one after another. And by the way, he was so gracious. He never indicated any frustration whatsoever. But <laughs> he hardly would get a bite in, and the next person would say to the next person. You know, when you have a distinguished guest, the focus is on that distinguished guest. And so I bring to you today the sermon entitled, Make Way for the Distinguished Guest. Let us pray. Father. Open our hearts and minds to the lesson, probably the single point that's most important today, that all of us would recognize what you're teaching us through this idea of make way for the special guest. And so send your spirit, use me in spite of me to be a blessing and thank you that you always hear an answer you never fail nor forsake, because all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. But because we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. And here's where we'll start our story of make way for the distinguished guest. I'm going to read just three verses, set the stage, and then we're going to look at the setting. Here's what it says. The Lord said to Moses, depart up from here, you and the people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, 
to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. And I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Havites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go along with you, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I destroy you on the way. And friends, this was horrifying news to Moses. Not that God called them a stiff-necked people. We'll soon see why. But the fact that he said, I will no longer go with you. Instead of me, I'm going to send an angel. And Moses went almost into panic mode, so to speak, because he did not want an angel. He wanted God himself. It is God that met him on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, the burning bush, that spoke to Moses and called him to go get the people. And when you look at verse 1, it's very interesting that he said, Go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt. Friend, Moses knew, I didn't bring them out, you brought them up. And then in verse 2, I'll send an angel. No, I don't want an angel, I want the real thing. And finally, I say the coup de gras here, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go among you. You're a stiff-necked people, and I will destroy you in the way. Where did God get this attitude about the Israelites? We're going to look at that as we move towards make way for the distinguished guest. And I'm going to start right here at the Red Sea. And I'm going to look at Exodus 14, 11, and notice what it says. Here's what the people did. And then they said to Moses, because there's no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us? to bring us up out of Egypt. This is not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the wilderness. Friends, no sooner did they leave Egypt and they get to the very water's edge of the Red Sea, their first encampment, when suddenly they see Pharaoh and his army coming, that they turn viciously upon Moses and they accuse him of bringing them there to die. But what did God do? Let's look at that. First of all, God had just done ten plagues. Ten plagues were poured out upon Egypt loosening their mind and their thinking to the point by the end, Pharaoh reluctantly let them go, but the people were saying, please leave, we want you out of here. And by the way, take this, 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 this with you. Not only that, what did God do? God parted the Red Sea and they walked on dry ground and then they watched God bring the water back on top of Pharaoh's army, which they would never see again. But what did they do after that? Well, friends, I'm going to look at the bitter waters of Mara. I'm going to look at Exodus 15, 20, 24, three days after they left the Red Sea, and the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? You know, he led them to a beautiful oasis. Um, I don't know how big the Mara Pond was, but it was water for all the people. And after three days, they were thirsty. Not 
Not that they didn't have water, but from the Red Sea to then in the desert, they had used it all up. And when they drank, the water was bitter. Three days after God's miraculous work of delivering the Israelites, parting the Red Sea and bringing it on the army, they turn on Moses and notice how it's wrote it and complained against Moses. Not just complained. Here's this idea, you brought us out of Egypt to kill us here, a thirst. Well, what did God do? Well, here's what God did. He said to Moses, by the way, Moses went to God. Listen what they're saying to me. What do I do? This water is bitter and you led us here. And God says, yes, that's right. I did because I have a tree. I want you to take that tree and throw it in the water. And the water became sweet. That's what God did. By the way, why tree? Why does it say tree? Because the Bible says that Jesus was hung on a tree. And when the cross of Calvary is ever included in any of our dilemmas, the bitter water becomes sweet. Well, that isn't all they did. Then we're going to go to Mount Sinai now. We made it to Mount Sinai, Exodus 16, verse 3. Here's what the people did again. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, what that we would have died of the hands of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out in of into the wilderness to kill us, this whole assembly with hunger. And friends, a short while later, they get to Mount Sinai. And, and I want you to know, they, they complained about the food. And, and I want you to look at the wording, the wording very carefully. I'm not going to read it again. You look at this, Exodus 16, verse 3. It doesn't say... We're out of food. We're hungry. It says we had flesh pots and plenty of food in Egypt, and you brought us out here to be hungry. They were anticipating a lack of food in the future. Hadn't existed yet, and they complained. Well, what did God do? Well, God rained down quail, right? They had all the meat to eat. In fact, it made them sick. A plague broke out and many of them died. Not only that, he gave them manna in the morning, bread from heaven. I can't wait to taste the manna. How about you? It must be really good and sweet. So this is what God did for these people. But what did the Israelites do next? I'm going to look at Exodus 17, verse 3. And it says this, and the people thirsted for, for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why is it that you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Just a short while later. And by the way, it took them three months to get to Mount Sinai. Here they get there, and they complain about the food. Now they're complaining about the water. And notice the way they do this. They do it through accusation. You know, you brought us out here to kill us. And, and Moses, by the way, you check these stories out. Moses kept saying, you're not complaining to me. You're complaining to God. I'm following his cloud by day and his fire by night. Oh, that's a big difference, isn't it? They still complained viciously. Accusations, critical, negative. Well, what did God do? You know what God did. He instructed Moses, now take that, that rod with you and Aaron, the rod that you touched the water and turned all the water into um, blood. And I want you to go, and I want you to hit a rock one time. Moses went, he brought the elders with him, he hit the rock one time, and water gushed out. Friends, it gushed out. 
and it continued to gush the whole time they were there. By the way, they were there at Mount Sinai for two years. They had enough water to cook with. They had enough water to drink. They had enough water to wash their clothes. And it continued for the whole time they were there. That's what God did for these people. But now we get to probably the epitome here. This is the fifth one. And remember, three months after they left Egypt, I'm going to be reading from Exodus 32, verse 1. It's called the golden calf. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us out out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what had become of him. And so you know the result of that. They, they built a golden calf. And they did a feast and sacrifices to that golden calf and threw a wild party. Back in the old days, we'd have called that an orgy. They celebrated just the way the Egyptians would have done it. They worshipped that golden calf, friends. And what did God do? I want to tell you what God did. First of all, you read your Bible carefully and you discover that God spoke the Ten Commandments the first time to the Israelites before he gave a copy to Moses. By the way, just for the fun of it, that means that he spoke them once and wrote them twice. That's three times. I think that would tell you how important the Ten Commandments are. He had spoken those commandments out loud. In fact, if you read it, it scared, and my son Roland would say, the bejeebies out of the Israelites. Listen to this. They came to Moses and said, tell them to stop, stop. He, let them talk to you, but, and you talk to us, and, but whatever he says, we will do. By the way, that's Exodus 19, verse 8. And not only that, in Exodus 24, verse 3, they said, we'll do whatever he said. And in Exodus 24, verse 7, they said, Whatever he said, we will do. That's three times, also three times. They promised. And this was all before the golden calf. And the first commandment was have no other God before you. And now we're starting to see why God said to Moses what he said. These are stiff-necked people. In the Hebrew, it means a stubborn people. And if I went with them, I would consume them in the way. And so, friends, we discover that God does one more thing. And that is this. I read from Exodus 32, 26. And then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. Friends, even after the golden calf, he gave them an invitation to show and said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. And how devastating and confusing and even disappointing that 3,000 people didn't come and they were destroyed. They were killed. And not only that, a little while later, a plague broke out and more who were involved in this worship service and in this party they threw, who were leaders, they also were destroyed. But God gave the invocation, invitation, friends. God loves his people. But look at how they complained all the way along in the matter of five Major times in three months. And 
and the last two times right there at Mount Sinai. And, G, and, and Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments written on blue stone by the finger of God. And so we see, that's why God said, I'm not going to go with you. If I do, I'll kill you all because you're so stiff-necked. But that wasn't good enough for Moses. But I'll get to that in a second. Instead, let's look at this. What did the people do? Let's go back to the story. I want to read to you what the people did. Look at this. This is interesting. Verse 4. And when the people heard these evil tidings. Okay. When the people received this bad news. Moses came and said, hey, because of our behavior, God is not going with us. And, and by the way, I want to clue you. Moses wasn't going to go either. He, the angel, oh man, wonderful angels. They minister to us. They, they excel in strength. But Moses was not going to settle for an angel. But when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. They repented. And listen to this. No man put on his ornaments, his jewelry. And the next verse. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you're a stiff necked people. You're stubborn. If I should come among you for one moment, I would consume you and destroy you. Now, therefore, Penitently, leave off all your ornaments, all your jewelry, that I may know what to do with you. And the Israelites left off all their ornaments from Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, onward. Wow, the people humbled themselves. And, 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 and I think it's amazing here because it clearly tells us that God was displeased. First of all, with the way they worshipped and celebrated, it was just like Egypt. Secondly, the way they were dressed and ornamented, just like the world, just like the Egyptians. And you see, he said, you want to, if you want me to go with you, show me signs of your repentance. And they obeyed God and took all that stuff off. Now, wait a minute. You may say, Pastor, hold on. They were in the wilderness. We're in the world. Did they get all this stuff? That's why reading through your Bible, you pick up things that you miss when you, <laughs> this book is so incredibly deep. When Moses called, was called by God to go and get the Israelites, God said to him, by the way, before you leave, you will plunder the people. And then when the ten last plagues, when the ten plagues fell, towards the end, God reminded him. First, he said, you will plunder the people. Then he said, send the people to the neighborhood and, and asked them and they gave them gold and silver and blue and purple and scarlet. And of course the people figured we earned this and they all put it on. They, it says clearly they put it on. But when they got to this situation in Mount Horeb, now God said, stop. And I want you to think, I don't want you to act like the Egyptians, I don't want you to dress like the Egyptians. I don't want you to ornament yourself like the Egyptians because you're a special people to me. You're not the Egyptians. You're not the world. You're my people. And I want you to notice I want you to notice here what Moses did. Remember I told you he wasn't satisfied. Well, there was a tent. He pitched it way out in the camp. 
And and when and he told the people that if you got anything to confess or talk to God, go there. It says he went there, and every time he went there, the people came into the entrance of their tents, and they watched. And sure enough, Moses would talk, and all of a sudden, a pillar of cloud would descend right there where they were. And they knew that God spoke face to face with Moses. And he went to that tent, and here's what he said. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, Show me now your way that I may know you and progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with you, perceiving and recognizing and understanding more strongly and clearly, and that I may find favor in your sight. And Lord, do consider that this nation is your people, not my people. And the Lord said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said, if your presence goes not with me, do not carry us up from here. For by what shall it be known that I and your people have found favor in your sight. Here it is, folks. Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinguished, I and your people, from all the other people upon the face of the earth? Whoa! And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you ask. But wait a minute, my friends. Hold on. I passed by something here very important. This is the point of the sermon. It says here, Moses said, Is it not your going with us? Friends, presence the presence of God so that we are distinguished. I and your people from all the other people upon the face of the earth. Friends, make way for the distinguished guests. First of all, the Bible calls us distinguished. Because we're the children of God, not because we're great, not because we're perfect, not even because we're different from the rest of the world, even though we're supposed to be, but because God is with us. We are distinguished. And when we say prepare the way for the distinguished guest, that guest is Jesus Christ. And we must do everything we can to prepare the way for Jesus to be the center, the focus, and, and the, the topic of discussion and of honor and worship at the Paradise Church, the Pahrump Church, the Oasis Church. His presence distinguishes us and from the rest of the world. Oh, friends, I'm telling you, we must strive to have Jesus in our hearts. And when we do, we are distinguished because we are honoring the real distinguished one, Jesus. And so we can in our churches, Paradise, Pahrump, and Oasis, we can keep the commandments and not eat pork and not swear and not this and not that and the list down the line. But if Jesus is not the focus and we are not acting like Jesus, we're not distinguished. And the distinguished guest is not amongst us. This 
has to be our focus. Do you remember the parable Jesus told? This is a really good one. It's in Luke. I believe it's Luke 14, in which he said, when you're invited to a wedding, don't go and sit in the highest place because you see a distinguished guest may come and the 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 head of the or maybe the groom of the wedding will come to you and say, you have to move down because this man is a distinguished guest and he is to sit where you sit and you move down and sit. And then it goes on to say, don't seek the high place. Instead, seek the low place and and let the groom come to you and say, no, I don't want you to sit here in this lowly place. I want you to sit in a higher place and be distinguished from all the other people. And how are we to understand that? James put it very simple. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Friends, we need to humble ourselves. If we want the presence of God that distinguishes us from the world to be in our presence, we must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. You know, that's a song. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher and he shall lift you up do you get that he shall lift you up and what do we our human nature tries to get us to lift us up but the only way that the distinguished guest can lift us up is we humble ourselves We humble ourselves to each other and to others, and especially, particularly, to Jesus Christ. And then we also will be distinguished guests. Let us pray. Father, oh, help us, Lord, to strive more earnestly to be like you. Help us to understand that you aren't like us, Lord, but with the Holy Spirit, we can be like you. And we need to be kind and patient. We need to be thoughtful instead of um, impulsive. And, 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 and to allow you to speak through our mouths and, and, and that the words of the Bible would be the centerpiece of our lives and they would be portrayed through our actions. Make this happen, Lord. Bless everyone who's watching. Help them not to be discouraged, but to know that you're there and you care and that you're inviting them to come. May they say yes. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, I want you to say yes. It'll be the best decision you ever made in your life, and God will reinforce it. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. We need to be like Jesus so we can be distinguished, and He can be lifted up as the real distinguished guest. God bless you, and have a beautiful rest of the Sabbath. He placed your hand on His Bible. He swear to tell the truth His name is on our greatest monuments On our money too When we pledge allegiance There's no doubt where we stand There's no separation We're one nation under
Thank you so much, Pastor Neary, for that word from the Lord. We've been lifted up by His grace, encouraged and spiritually nourished by His grace. And friends, we thank you for worshiping with us. How lovely it is to spend the Sabbath together. You know, one day we'll spend Sabbath together in that city beyond the blue, beyond the stars. But we got to be ready. And that is why I urge you to give your life to Jesus right now. Just say, Jesus, I want to give my life to you and covenant to get closer to him. You know, I'm going to put an email on the screen. And if you want help getting closer to Christ, if you have a prayer request, for example, or, or you just want to reach out, go ahead and send us a message and we can pray together. Even if electronically, we can pray and we'll see you next Sabbath, friends. Worshiping in spirit and truth. God has plans for you. Just be patient. And as always, <laughs> be encouraged. <laughs>